epics of ancient Greece, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, but before we get into that, I thought I would just give you guys a brief introduction to myself. So my name is Jacob. I am a graduate student at the University of Calgary. I'm going into the final year of my master's degree in Greek and Roman studies, where I personally focus especially on ancient Greek history of what scholars call the Archaic period, which is the same time period when Homer himself is thought to have lived. So the topic I'm going to be discussing uh, today is the topic of assessing the historical origins of the Homeric epics. So we'll be looking at whether the Homeric epics are purely examples of fiction or storytelling, or if instead there's some historical value that we can derive from these epics as well, and if we can gauge its historical accuracy. Um, so without further ado, let's just get right into it. So. Uh, I'm going to start off by giving you guys a brief introduction to who Homer was and what his epics were, because I know not all of you guys may be fully familiar. Um, so who was Homer? Um, you guys may initially think that this is a fairly easy question for scholars to answer, but it actually isn't at all. Um, the so-called Homeric question, as it's known, um, remains a highly debated topic. So uh, to this day, there remains no clear scholarly consensus on things like whether an individual named Homer ever truly existed and authored the works that we have today. Um, if so, so if Homer really did exist, then it remains unclear under what precise circumstances, exactly where and exactly when Homer lived. Um, there is debate about whether the Iliad and Odyssey were even composed by the same author. And there's certainly a lot of debate and contention over to what extent we can really trust our later ancient Greek sources and what they have to say about Homer's life or identity. So I thought that that would be an important thing to just preface my presentation on so that you know what you see here in this following slide is by no means uh, set in stone or fully settled. So with that aside, generally speaking, if we are to trust our various ancient Greek sources, and certainly what many scholars today argue, then we can say Homer was a man from the region of Ionia, which is this region you guys see here on the southwestern coast of Anatolia, or modern day Turkey. Um, Homer was quite possibly from the island of Chios, which is this island here. Many ancient Greek sources and traditions seem to associate him with this region. Although we don't know for sure, as there are traditions that associate him with other parts of Ionia as well, such as the Greek city of Smyrna or the modern city of Izmir. Um, so we don't really know. Um, Homer likely lived sometime around the eighth century BC. And he was a bard who memorized and recited uh, various pieces of poetry that had been passed down to him orally. And we can actually tell that Homer is relying on an oral and not written tradition just by analyzing his epics um, themselves. So uh, throughout the Homeric epics, um, Homer repeatedly reuses the same sort of narrative structures or formulas as a way of making it a bit easier for the poet himself to uh, recite and memorize uh, the works that he's been taught orally. Um, so for example, if you were to pick up a copy of the Iliad or Odyssey today, one thing you would almost immediately notice is that Homer constantly uses epithets whenever he's referring to a person or a thing. So he very rarely refers to the person or thing by the name itself and leaves it at that, he will attach an epithet to it. So for example, if he's talking about the Greek hero Achilles, he won't just say Achilles, but he will call him swift-footed Achilles. Or if he's talking about Odysseus, he will say Odysseus of many wiles. Um, or if he's talking about the ocean or the sea, he will call it the wine dark sea and so on. So these are all sort of repetitive um, epithets done as a way of making it easier to recite this oral poetry. So um, we believe that Homer, he basically took various poems that he had learned, again, orally, and he kind of stitched them together using his own poetical skill to compose a much longer epic. And um, basically, these various poems that we believe he took, um, they were all similar in terms of their theme or content. So um, they often discussed the distant mythical past uh, 
a time that uh, scholars today would call the Late Bronze Age or the period around 1200 BC. And they focus um, especially around this event called the Trojan War. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, the Trojan War was an event where um, basically a prince from the land of Troy visited the Greek city of Sparta. And there he met the Spartan queen, Helen, who was apparently the most beautiful woman in the whole world. And as a result, this Trojan prince became enamored with her. And he actually kidnaps her and brings her back to the distant land of Troy, which was somewhere in northwestern Anatolia. In response to this, the Greeks get really mad. They form a coalition and they send over a thousand ships out to the land of Troy, where they fight a brutal 10 year long war. And during this war, many famous Greek heroes lose their lives along the way. And in the end, the Greeks are able to defeat the Trojans through a ruse or a trick, the very famous Trojan horse, um, where basically the Greeks snuck some of their um, selected soldiers into uh, to go into a large wooden horse. Uh, and then the rest of the army pretended to leave Troy as though they were quitting the war and heading back to Greece. And when the Trojans came across this wooden horse, they thought it was a, an offering to the gods. So they decided to bring this horse within their walls. And at nighttime, the soldiers stowed within, broke free from this horse, opened the gates of the city and um, let the rest of the Greek army in who proceed to destroy it and burn it over the course of that night. Um, so while the various poems that Homer was using to form his epics, like I just said, they are similar in terms of their theme and content. That doesn't mean they're similar in terms of their point of origin. In fact, we can tell by analyzing the Homeric epics that he seems to have taken um, various poems and traditions that came from a variety of different parts of the ancient Greek world. Um, and you can tell this by looking at the particular type of Greek that this, uh, these epics are composed in. So they're composed in what scholars call Homeric Greek, which was never actually a form of Greek spoken uh, conversationally in antiquity. It's actually a mixture or combination of a variety of different ancient Greek dialects. Um, so the dialect that you see the most often throughout these epics is the Ionic dialect, which you guys see here in a sort of dark blue. And this, of course, to a certain extent makes sense because like I just told you guys, many scholars and many ancient Greek sources seem to believe that Homer was from the region of Ionia where the Ionic dialect was primarily spoken. However, in addition to that, there's also a great deal of Aeolic dialect mixed in there as well, which you guys see here in yellow, uh, spoken in the regions of Thessaly, Boeotia, and Aeolia. And there's also some examples of Arcado Cypriot dialect, which you guys see here in light green, which is spoken in the region of Arcadia, which is the uh, central mountainous region of the Peloponnese as well as on the island of Cyprus, which lies um, further east in the Mediterranean. Um, so clearly Homer was taking stories that came from a variety of different parts of the ancient Greek world. And just like how they could come from different parts of the ancient Greek world, they could also come from different time periods. So some of these oral traditions may be older than others. And this is where we get into the topic of um, the historical accuracy of the uh, Homeric epics as we might think that, well, perhaps maybe some of these older traditions that he's using, maybe they have a degree of historical truth to them. Um, but we'll get into that all later on. So as far as we can tell, the first of Homer's epics to be composed was a work called the Iliad, which focuses on the wrath of the very famous Greek hero Achilles uh, during the 10th and final year of the Trojan War. The second of Homer's epics to be composed was a work called the Odyssey, which was an epic that focused on the Greek hero Odysseus and his long arduous voyage home from the Trojan War after the conflict had been completed and kind of focuses on the various misfortunes that Odysseus suffers along his way back home to the island of Ithaca. So very soon after their composition, the Homeric epics became widely popular and highly revered as works of poetry throughout the ancient Greek world. And we know that eventually Homer's works were written down and distributed um, quite widely. 
Now, we don't know exactly when this copying into a manuscript form occurred. It's quite possible that during Homer's own lifetime or very soon after the composition of his epics, they were written down. Uh, we certainly get some evidence of uh, some copying occurring at roughly the same time as Homer himself. So if you look at this picture here I have for you guys on the side, this is a very famous piece of pottery that comes from the Greek colony of Ischia and dates to around the 8th century BC, which again is roughly the same time period when Homer himself is thought to have lived. And um, on this piece of pottery, it appears to be quoting several lines from Homer's Iliad. Um, now, of course, quoting a few lines of, of his works on a piece of pottery is very different than quoting or copying down all 15,000 lines that make up the Iliad. Um, but nevertheless, it's interesting to know that at least some writing of Homer's epics is occurring um, at this time period. Uh, at the very latest, we can say that um, the Homeric epics are being copied no later than the mid sixth century BC, because at this time period, we hear that in the Greek city of Athens, uh, that was ruled by a tyrant by the name of Pisistratus at the time. We hear that at this time, Pisistratus formally commissions the copying of the Homeric epics in manuscript form, um, partly for his own library, and partly so that he could give these copies to poets who were reciting the Homeric epics at a local festival called the Panathenaic Games, um, with the idea being that if they had these manuscript copies in front of them, they could recite these epics with a greater degree of accuracy. So you could say in the mid sixth century BC in Athens anyways, there's a degree of canonization that's going on here with these works. So throughout antiquity, the Trojan War and other major events recorded in the Homeric epics were widely accepted as historical fact and were never seriously challenged. Um, we have several ancient Greek historians, for example, like Herodotus or Thucydides, who never really doubt that the Trojan War really happened, even if they may have their problems with some minor episodes or events reported in Homer. As a whole, they accept that what he um, wrote about or talked about in his epics was accurate um, historically. And this sort of belief in the historicity of the Trojan War, to a certain extent, continued even um, into the early Christian or medieval periods. Um, however, while Homer's epics certainly remained highly regarded as works of poetry, over time, their historical accuracy was increasingly doubted. And certainly by the time of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, the Homeric epics had largely been relegated to the status of a myth or fiction. And to a certain extent, this makes sense. Uh, if you were to pick up a copy of the Iliad or Odyssey today, you would pretty much immediately notice that there are several things about these epics that go completely against our modern sort of scientific understanding of the world. So for example, um, the various gods of Greek mythology play a very important role in the outcome of everyday events um, throughout these epics and frequently interact with the heroes of these works. Um, in the Odyssey especially, we hear of a number of mythical creatures like Cyclops and giants and sea monsters and so on. And even in the Iliad, which is generally thought to be a bit of a more realistic epic compared to the Odyssey, there are still several things that we can point to as being very clearly fantastical, like, for example, the famous hero Achilles. He apparently owns horses that are immortal. And these horses can also apparently talk because at one point they start um, breaking out into full speech and start delivering Achilles various prophecies. So we can all look at this stuff today and say, this is not history, it's clearly fiction. And if there are so many fictitious or fantastical elements to these epics, who's to say that they not, might not just be entirely fiction, right? Um, well, this, uh, this way of looking at it changed dramatically in the 19th century as a relatively new form of study called archaeology began to come to the forefront. And archaeology is basically the study of the past by analyzing the material remains left behind by um, previous or past cultures and civilizations. Um, and basically, in the year 1870, a wealthy German businessman by the name of Heinrich Schliemann funded excavations at a site 
um, that was a mound in northwestern Turkey called Hisarlik, um, which had been identified by a British amateur archaeologist Frank Calvert as the site of Troy itself, based on the descriptions of the city and its location found in the Homeric epics and some other um, ancient Greek sources. And basically, as they did their excavations there, the excavations actually prove that there was indeed a large Bronze Age city at that very location. So a city dating to roughly the same time period when the Trojan War was thought to have occurred. However, these excavations were very problematic. Heinrich Schliemann uh, employed a very improper use of archaeological methodology, to put it very mildly. Um, so it's important to bear in mind that the site that they were excavating wasn't just one city, but kind of nine cities built on top of each other. Um, and each layer of this city was sort of marked off by a destruction layer um, caused either by a natural event like an earthquake or a landslide or caused by human beings. So perhaps a fire grew too far out of control that it destroyed the city entirely or perhaps it was destroyed in a war. And basically whenever this city was destroyed, it appears that the local inhabitants decided to build a new city directly on top of the ruins of the previous one. And that's how we basically got this sort of layered structure. And anyways, in order for Heinrich Schliemann to get down to the layer that he thought belonged to the Troy of the Homeric epics, he employed several destructive methods, including the use of dynamite, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, moreover, when Schliemann finally arrived at the layer that he thought belonged to the Troy of the Homeric epics, uh, what scholars today call Troy Layer 2, he had actually dug far too deep. He arrived at a city that was about a thousand years too early to belong to anything related to the Trojan War. Um, moreover, while he was digging around within this layer of Troy, again, Troy Layer 2, um, he decided to make several sensationalist claims about what he was finding without really the proper evidence or backing. So for example, um, he found a large hoard of gold and silver and other goods that he decided to name Priam's treasure because in his mind, they must have belonged to King Priam, the leader of the Trojans throughout the Trojan War, according to Homer. And within this uh, so-called Priam's treasure, he found a diadem, which he decided to name the Jewels of Helen, because in his mind, again, they must have belonged to Helen of Sparta, the woman who was kidnapped and brought to Troy, and therefore the woman who was kind of involved in the very start of the conflict to begin with. Um, and he actually decided to give this so-called Jewels of Helen to his wife as a gift, even though it was by no means his place to give this historical item to her. So that's what you guys can actually see in this picture here on the left. This is Heinrich Schliemann's wife, Helen, or sorry, Heinrich Schliemann's wife, Sophie, wearing the Jewels of Helen, which she did um, publicly, apparently quite often. Um, and basically... Um, the Jewels of Helen, along with the other goods he found in this so-called Priam's treasure, he uh, decided to smuggle out of the country illegally. Um, and for this reason, the Ottoman Empire actually banned him from ever returning to the country. Um, but uh, by analyzing these goods that he discovered in the so-called Priam's treasure today, scholars are able to say that Heinrich Schliemann quite possibly forged or tampered with some of his evidence here. It seems that what he did in some instances was that he found various um, small gold goods sort of scattered around this layer of Troy, and he decided to combine them together to form something that in his opinion was a bit more extravagant or impressive so he could make some more sensationalist claims about it. Um, but anyways, needless to say, the archeological practice that was done here at this excavation was very shady. Um, but despite the, the flaws of the excavations, we today can say that in all likelihood, the site that they excavated, um, Hisarlik, is truly the site of Homer's Troy. It does seem to very closely match the descriptions we find. And by analyzing the upper layers of this city, or, or what remains from them anyways after Schliemann's excavations, we can say that um, layer six actually very closely matches Homer's description of the city um, as it had a very large population, some monumental um, pieces of architecture, 
and um, particularly some very high sloped walls, which is what Troy was famous for throughout antiquity. However, unfortunately, this layer of Troy appears to have been destroyed naturally in an earthquake, so not in a war, and it appears to have been destroyed around the year 1300 BC, which is about a century too early to belong to the Trojan War, if we are to um, take seriously the traditional dating of this event found in our various ancient Greek sources. The following layer of Troy, uh, Troy Layer 7, it was a much smaller city built from the ruins of Troy Layer 6, but it does appear to have been destroyed in a conflict, which is really interesting. So there is um, evidence of wide-scale burning at the site, and there are several arrowheads found embedded into the walls of the city and found within this destruction layer. Um, and moreover, by dating this destruction, archeologists are able to say that it occurred around the year 1180 BC, which is really interesting because this almost precisely matches the traditional dating of the Trojan War found in our various ancient Greek sources. So for example, the Greek author Eratosthenes claimed the destruction of Troy occurred around 1184 or 1183 BC. The Greek author Sosibius claimed it occurred around 1172. The author Timaeus claims it happened at 1193 and so on. So our various Greek sources seem to have gotten it remarkably right when this destruction occurred at the site, which is really neat. So after Heinrich Schliemann was banned from the Ottoman Empire for his shady practices at Troy, he decided to conduct excavations in Greece, a country where he was allowed to be. And in 1876, he began excavating a site called Mycenae, which according to Homer, was the hometown or home city of Agamemnon, the king and hero who led the entire coalition of Greeks throughout the Trojan War. And interestingly, while he was there, Schliemann discovered a massive Bronze Age palatial center, um, which remains to this day actually the largest and most fortified one found on mainland Greece dating to this time period, so dating to the Bronze Age. Um, uh, so basically, since Heinrich Schliemann's day, archaeologists have conducted excavations at numerous uh, sites that date to the Bronze Age, like Pylos you see here, or Athens, or, or Kamenos. And despite these excavations, Mycenae still remains the largest city at this time period. And as a result, scholars have decided to name this whole culture that appears to have existed on mainland Greece at this time, they've named them the Mycenaeans. Um, and this is really interesting because it does seem to corroborate a lot of what we hear from Homer about this distant past civilization. So like I was just telling you guys in Homer, it's the king of Mycenae who's able to lead all of the Greeks in war against the Trojans. And just like how Homer mentions that, we archeologically can say that Mycenae does appear to have been the preeminent city or kingdom at this time period. Um, in addition to that, throughout his epics, Homer never actually refers to the Greeks as Greeks or as Hellenes. He uses a variety of different terms when talking about the Greeks. And the term that he uses the most, uh, or one of the terms he uses the most often is this term you see here, uh, Argives. And all Argives really means is someone who's from the Argive plain or the Argolid as you see it spelled here, which was the plain that Mycenae occupied along with some other Bronze Age cities like Argos or Tyrians, which appear to have been subordinated to Mycenae at this time or, or under the kingdom of Mycenae's control. Um, so again, the fact that Homer seems to characterize all of the Greeks as Argives seems to corroborate the fact that archeologically, it was the cities of the Argive plain that were the most prominent throughout mainland Greece at this time period. So here are just some pictures that I wanted to show you guys of the site of Mycenae itself, just so you guys could get an impression of just how magnificent this site really is. Um, so the picture you see here on the left is a picture of the famous Lion's Gate that enters the citadel of Mycenae. And the person you see here on the top right is actually a Heinrich Schliemann himself. 
Uh, the picture you see here on the right, uh, on the other hand, is just uh, some more pictures of the walls of Mycenae, just so you can get a sense of how tall these fortifications are still to this day, and just the size of the blocks that they were using to, to form this construction, which is really impressive. Um, the people who are walking by here are, are dwarfed in comparison. So while Heinrich Schliemann was at Mycenae, he focused his excavations, especially on a site that we today call Grave Circle A, which lies just within the walls of the Citadel, just past that Lion's Gate I was showing you guys earlier. And Grave Circle A was basically a circle that contained six shaft graves. And each of these shafts contained the remains of multiple deceased individuals. Um, and what you're looking at here on the top right is a picture of the modern site of Grave Circle A, which you can visit today. And the picture here on the top left is a picture of me myself at the site of Grave Circle A at Mycenae, where I was fortunate enough to deliver a presentation there just about a month ago. So while Heinrich Schliemann was excavating at Mycenae and Grave Circle A, he discovered a tremendous number of grave goods that were accompanied with these deceased individuals. And these grave goods, as you can tell by looking at these pictures here, were incredibly ornate and expensive. Um, but they're not only interesting to us because they're expensive or, or lavish, but because these grave goods seem to also corroborate or prove a lot of the things, again, that we hear from Homer about this distant past civilization. So for example, um, like I was already telling you guys, throughout the Homeric epics, Homer frequently uses epithets when he refers to things or people. And the epithet that he uses whenever he talks about Mycenae is this epithet here, polycrusos, which means rich in gold or of much gold. And after digging around at Grave Circle A, we can finally understand why Homer uses this term, because in reality, Mycenae was really rich in gold, as you can see here with all these various gold grave goods that were discovered at the site. Um, in addition to that, um, Homer also goes into uh, quite a lengthy description in the Iliad of a particular cup that belonged to a man named Nestor. Uh, Nestor was an old man who kind of served as an advisor of Agamemnon, um, who again was the, the king and leader of all of the Greeks throughout this Trojan War. And in this description, Homer says the following. He says, uh, there was a beautiful, very beautiful cup, which the old man, AKA Nestor, brought from his home. It was studded with gold rivets, and had four handles. On each handle were golden doves feeding, one on either side, and underneath it rested on two feet. And this is very interesting because once we started digging around at Grave Circle A, we discovered goblets that match this description almost perfectly. So as you can see here, this is a gold cup um, where there appears to be doves resting on each of its handles feeding into whatever liquid or libation would have been stored within, which is really neat. Um, in addition to that, Homer seems to provide a very accurate um, representation of what warfare was like in the late Bronze Age. So Homer not only frequently says that the weapons these various heroes were using were made out of bronze, which is of course correct because this is the Bronze Age after all, but in addition to that, Homer frequently describes these heroes riding into battle on chariots, which is very interesting because during Homer's own time, the Greeks did not engage in chariot warfare at all. Yet once we start to dig around at sites like Grave Circle A, we find plenty of examples that prove that the, the Mycenaeans or these Bronze Age Greeks really did engage in chariot warfare. So as you guys see here on the left, here are some of the, um, the tombstones or the funeral stele used to mark the graves at Grave Circle A. And they frequently um, contain depictions of chariot warfare as you see here. And there were also several portrayals of chariots uh, also found on gold signet rings that were buried with these deceased individuals like you guys see here on the top right. In addition to that, Homer frequently describes throughout his epics people wielding what we today would call tower shields. So large rectangular shields that 
are so broad that they're pretty much able to fully cover the combatant. Um, one person who Homer especially describes wielding a shield like this is the hero Ajax, the son of Telamon. Um, and Homer says that Ajax's shield was so large that it could not only fully protect himself, but could also be used to help defend this famous archer named Teucer who fought alongside him throughout the Trojan War. And this is interesting because again, once we start digging around at Grave Circle A, we find several examples of these tower shields, uh, like the ones you see here, these large rectangular shields. Uh, this one is particularly interesting because it appears to be used the same way I just described to you, where it's not only being used to defend the combatant himself, but perhaps also this archer who's fighting alongside him. Uh, and here's just another example of a tower shield that was found on a signet ring uh, buried within Grave Circle A. Um, and this is really interesting because during Homer's own day, the Greeks did not use shields like this at all. They used smaller, rounder shields uh, in combat. So the fact that Homer gets this right is, is certainly noteworthy. Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you guys about was how at one point in the Iliad, Homer describes the hero Odysseus um, going out on a bit of a night raid against the Trojan camp. And as Odysseus is getting ready for this, uh, this raid, he's putting on his armor, Homer goes into quite a description of the helmet that Odysseus wore. And he says, quote, it was a helmet of leather carefully made. On the inside, it was stretched tight by many straps. And on the outside, close set pieces of a shiny toothed boar's white tusks ran this way and that very cunningly made, and inside it was fitted to a felt cap. And this is really interesting because again, once we start digging around at my CD, we find several examples of these helmets made out of boar's tusks. And um, Homer's description of these boar tusk helmets is pretty much spot on. He even gets it right that the tusks ran this way and that meaning they seem to switch direction here um, with each layer as you go along, um, which is again, really neat because during Homer's own time, these helmets would not have existed. As far as we can tell archeologically, these helmets fell out of use more than 400 years before Homer ever lived. Um, they fell out of use around 1200 BC at the very end of the Bronze Age. And again, Homer's living sometime in the eighth century BC. So a good deal later on. And yet he gets this right, even though he probably never would have encountered something like this during his own lifetime. So I just wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about archeology span since Heinrich Schliemann's day. So today we can confirm that in addition to the site of Mycenae, Homer seems to accurately list the number of other major cities or palatial centers that existed in uh, the late Bronze Age in Greece. Um, so especially in book two of Homer's Iliad, he goes into quite a description of all the various Greek cities that contributed to the war effort in the, in the Trojan War. And since then, uh, archeologists have been able to go to these cities, dig around and have discovered a considerable number of archeological evidence um, dating to the late Bronze Age, so to roughly the time period when the Trojan War itself is thought to have occurred. Um, however, it is important to bear in mind that Homer was not always right in his portrayal or characterization of this distant past. So for example, as uh, heroes die on the battlefield and, and so on, um, Homer describes several funeral scenes. And when he's describing these funeral scenes, he's very clearly describing cremation occurring. So he's under the impression that these distant past peoples cremated their dead, when in reality, we can say that's not the case at all. These people were actually buried or inhumated, um, as we discovered at Grave Circle A and several other um, grave sites dating to the late Bronze Age since then. Um, so that's certainly an issue. And in addition to that, we know that Heinrich Schliemann's methodology at Mycenae, just like it was at Troy, was incredibly flawed. So uh, Schliemann was far too eager to draw connections to the Homeric epics without really any proper evidence or backing. So for example, while he was digging around at Grave Circle A, he discovered a gold funerary mask that was put on top of the, the face of one of these deceased individuals. And he decided to name this mask the Mask of Agamemnon, because in his mind, it must have belonged to King Agamemnon, again, the leader of the Greeks throughout the Trojan War. Uh, 
Um, however, today scholars are able to say that this mask did not belong to Agamemnon at all. It's about three or four centuries too early to have belonged to uh, anybody related to the Trojan War whatsoever. In addition to that, by analyzing this so-called mask of Agamemnon today, um, which is housed at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, scholars are able to say that it was quite possibly forged or tampered with. Um, so as you guys see here, the other uh, gold funerary masks dissevered at Grave Circle A, they all have very round faces um, and not really a lot of facial hair. Um, but this mask of Agamemnon, which you see here on the top left, is very uh, sort of pointy and it has a lot of facial hair, this big handlebar mustache and beard. Um, the eyes also appear different than the eyes of the other uh, masks. And basically as a re result, scholars think that it's quite possible Schliemann found a gold funeral mask and decided to change it up a little bit so that it looked a bit more, um, a bit more extravagant or again, a little bit more impressive in his opinion, which is really unfortunate. So while archeologists uh, began in the late 19th century with people like Heinrich Schliemann to try and prove the historical accuracy of the Trojan War and excavations have continued on since then throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, um, other scholars have looked to a new way of trying to test the historical accuracy of the Trojan War and the Homeric epics, and that has been through linguistics. Um, so in the year 1906, Archaeologists were excavating at a city called Hattusa that you see here, which was the capital of a very powerful empire in the Bronze Age called the Hittites or the Hatti. Um, they controlled much of central Anatolia, as you see here, and uh, even rivaled Egypt in terms of its power and strength. And as they were digging around at the capital of the Hittite empire, uh, Hattusa, they discovered an archive of more than 30,000 tablets written in cuneiform script. And as scholars began to translate these tablets, they discovered that some of them were very interesting. Um, they included royal letters that describe a city on the northwestern coast of Anatolia that was allied to the Hittites or was more likely a vassal state of theirs. Um, and the Hittites call it Wailusa, as you see here. And today linguists are able to say that Wailusa is almost certainly the same as the Greek term Ilion, they're related. Um, and Ilion is the term Homer uses throughout his epics for the city of Troy. Um, it's actually from this term that we get the name of one of Homer's epics, the Iliad. Um, so they seem to corroborate the fact that Troy really existed and, and, was, and went by a similar name at this time period. Um, in addition to that, these letters also mention a powerful empire that controlled the Aegean Sea, and they named this, these people the Ahiyawa, which again, linguists are able to say is almost certainly related to the Greek term Achaeans. Um, so like I was telling you guys earlier, Homer never actually refers to the Greeks as Greeks throughout these epics. He uses a variety of different terms. And uh, I've already mentioned one of those terms to you guys, the Argives, but the term that Homer actually uses the most often throughout his epics is this term here, the Achaeans. So it's interesting to know that it's not just Homer who's referring to these distant Greeks as Achaeans, um, but also the Hittites are referring to these um, Bronze Age Greeks as uh, Achaeans or Ahiyawa as well. And in these letters, they claim that the uh, Ahiyawa or the Greeks um, were very politically and militarily involved in the region around Troy or Wailusa starting around 1400 BC. So starting around 1400, these Greeks seem to have supported several revolts and rebellions in the regions against the Hittite empire. And in a letter um, known as the Tawagala letter that dates to around 1250 BC, it even mentions that these Hittites engaged in armed hostilities against the Greeks over the city of Wailusa or the city of Troy, which is really neat. Um, now, this particular um, fight over Troy that's described here in this letter, it doesn't correspond archeologically to any destruction that occurred at the location, 
um, nor does it date to the right time period to belong to the famous Trojan War that we all know of. It is about a century too early, but nevertheless, it's interesting to know that in the centuries leading up to the traditional dating of the Trojan War, the Greeks were very much politically and militarily involved in the region around Troy. The last thing I wanted to mention here as well was one of these Hittite records even claim that the name of the king of Troy or Wailusa, his name was Alexandu, which linguists are able to say is most certainly related to the Greek name Alexander, um, which is the same name that Homer claims um, belonged to the very prince of Troy who kidnaps Helen of Sparta. So the person who kind of kickstarts the war itself. Now, if any of you guys know your Trojan War history, you'll know that the Alexander mentioned in Homer's epics never actually becomes king of Troy. He's killed before he can ever succeed his father. And in addition to that, this letter, again, dates about a century too early to belong to the, the very famous Trojan War that we all know of. So the Alexandu that they're mentioning is not the same as the very Alexander that we know of from myth. But nevertheless, it's very interesting to note that the name Alexander was in circulation within the royal family or royal household that ruled over Troy in the centuries leading up to the traditional dating of this conflict. So while some scholars have been trying to uh, prove or, or assess the historical accuracy of the Trojan War by analyzing Hittite records, others have been able to do so by analyzing the records left behind by the Mycenaeans. Um, so as sites like Mycenae on mainland Greece and some other Bronze Age cities in the region have been excavated, they kept discovering this written script that was put on small clay tablets like the one you see here. And they decided to name this written script Linear B. However, scholars did not know how to read this script at all. Uh, it was entirely unrelated to the Greek alphabet that appears later on in antiquity the alphabet that um, Greeks still use to this day. Um, so people didn't know how to read it, but this changed dramatically in 1952 when a man by the name of Michael Ventris was able to decipher this script for the first time. And when he did so, he proved that the people who inhabited Greece throughout the Bronze Age were in fact ethnically Greek. So up until this time period, while we were discovering palaces and cities that date to the Bronze Age, throughout mainland Greece, we didn't know if it was actually Greeks who were building uh, these cities. It was quite possible that it was an entirely different people. And then when the civilization seems to have collapsed at the end of the Bronze Age, it was only then that Greek speaking people migrated into the region and took over from this previous population. However, um, once we were able to decipher Linear B, we found out this wasn't the case at all. Uh, it was actually, that these people living there were in fact Greeks because what they're writing was a very early form of the ancient Greek language. And these tablets even make mention of the various Greek gods of mythology like Zeus or Hera, Poseidon or Dionysus. Um, each of these gods play a major role in the Trojan uh, cycle or the Homeric epics, which is really neat. In addition to that, by translating these Linear B tablets, we were able to say that the place names that Homer ascribes to these cities is very consistent with what they were called throughout the Bronze Age. So it's not like Homer is referring to a city by such and such a name, but in reality, during that time period, they called it something entirely different. No, that's, that's actually not happening. So for example, in his epics, uh, Homer makes a few mentions of a city on the island of Crete, which he calls Kanasas. And when this city is written out in linear B, we see it spelled Kanoso, as you see here. Uh, so it's pretty much keeping the same name entirely over time. In addition to that, as we were translating linear B, we learned that a king at this time period was called a Wanax. And this is very interesting because it explains why Homer uses this very unusual term annex when he's referring to kings in his epics. Um, so it's a very unusual term because during Homer's own day, the, the word you would use in Greek for a king was a basileus, so an entirely unrelated term. So for the longest time, scholars would read Homer and wonder, why is he using this, this weird term annex whenever he's referring to a king? And then sure enough, once we're able to decipher linear B, we discover, aha, 
Homer's using this term annex because during that time period, they themselves would call them annex or wannex. There's a variety of other Greek terms like that that Homer too seems to get remarkably right. Um, the last thing I just wanted to point out as well was in these linear B tablets, we get reference to a variety of names that feature quite prominently throughout the Homeric epics like Achilles or Ajax. And this is interesting because during Homer's own time period, um, everyday people did not really use these names um, in any sort of common way. But by analyzing these texts, we're able to say that during the late Bronze Age, the time period when the Trojan War is thought to have occurred, they most certainly are using these names very, very frequently. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what I've told you guys so far and, and bring this presentation to a conclusion, um, given the significant archeological and linguistic evidence that seems to corroborate Homer's accounts, it seems highly likely that at least some of the oral traditions he, uh, Homer used to create the Iliad and Odyssey, they were considerably old and so much so that they were able to accurately preserve some important details about everyday life in the Bronze Age and about this Mycenaean civilization that we've since been able to discover. Um, however, and this is an important however, our evidence remains incomplete. And because of some of these shady archaeological practices done in the 19th century by people like Heinrich Schliemann, it remains to this day unclear whether the Trojan War itself ever truly happened. Again, there's this big debate or controversy where Troy Lair 6 seems to closely match Homer's description of the city, but it's destroyed naturally and about a century too early. Whereas Troy Lair 7 is destroyed in a war and at roughly the right time period, but the city is very small and it's so small that if it was destroyed um, by the Greeks, it doesn't appear to have been destroyed in the same way that Homer describes. It doesn't seem like a small city like this would have been able to um, withstand a siege for 10 years or that it would have required a thousand Greek ships to sail to the city in order to defeat it. And moreover, archeologically, we can't even prove that this layer of Troy was destroyed in a war by the Greeks. It's possible that it was destroyed by the Greeks, but it's also possible it was destroyed by anybody else at that time period as well. So um, our evidence remains a little bit incomplete to this day, but nevertheless, the archeological and linguistic evidence that, that corroborates Homer's accounts is very considerable. And that's the kind of message I wanna leave you guys off with here today, that uh, in addition to the fact that the Homeric epics are, are, are really valuable in terms of um, being works of storytelling and epic poetry. They're also valuable because they can be analyzed for its historical value um, and its historical accuracies. Uh, anyways, that kind of wraps up my presentation there. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask.